There's always two types of opinions. One is your opinion, the other one is wrong opinion. <laughs> is the government doing enough in response to the coronavirus spread? Yes, they're doing enough. In fact, they should be doing even more. No, they're limiting our freedoms. They should be doing less. Some say that it is a good idea that churches are closing their doors and canceling their face-to-face -face meetings and switching to online, what we're doing right now. Others say, no, this is the time to meet and to be fed with the Word and the sacrament. We're full of opinions from what is the best car to drive to who is the worst president of the United States to how do I make my biscuits. This type of opinion and type of thinking that my thoughts, my opinion is the right one it leads not only to making black and white statements, but also to more of a monologue than a dialogue when you talk to other people. Even when you ask questions, you really are looking for an approval of what you think is right. For example, let's say you're driving with your spouse and your spouse asks you, you're driving by a restaurant, and, and uh, she or he asks you if you're hungry and should we get something to eat? Well, you know full well it's not a question. <laughs> the mind is already made up. So all you have to do is do whatever he or she tells you. You're not being asked about your opinion on the issue. There's not much of an exchange in this type of dialogue. It's more of, I tell you what is right. I already know the right answer even before I ask you. That's what's happening in our gospel text for today. You see a series of questions that people ask. But they're not looking for answers that would give them a, another opinion. They're just looking for answers that would validate their point of view. It's more of a series of statements where men think that they know better than God. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You caught that. They're not asking for Jesus' point of view. They already formed their opinion. It's caused by sin either by man's sin, that man's sin, or his parents' sins. And all they're looking for is Jesus' approval of what they think. There's even more like that. The neighbors and those who had seen him, the blind man, before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. Some men even made up the minds that there's no way that this blind man was healed. So he had, had to keep on saying, I am the man. I am the man. Why did he have to keep on saying that? Well, because they would not believe him. 
No matter how many times he repeated it, they already made up their minds. They knew that they were right, and he was wrong. It continues in the same venue. So the Pharisees again ask him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud in my eyes, and I, was, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man, speaking about Jesus, is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. It's pretty clear that the man already made up their mind about God. They already have the right answers, their own opinion, and they're just looking for a proof that they're right. Now, the rest of the text is more of the same. The Jews are, cons are convinced that Jesus is a fraud and that the blind man wasn't blind to begin with. And so they call in the blind man's parents. But they cannot give a complete answer because they know that the Jews already agreed that if anyone confessed Jesus to be the Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue, the text says. In other words, the man already decided that Jesus is not the Son of God, that Jesus is a fraud, and anyone who confesses him is fraud too. Their minds are made up. So they call the blind man again, and they start with a statement about Jesus and this is what they say about Jesus. We know this man is a sinner. Once again, all they need is for somebody to agree that they're right. Now, that doesn't work out. The blind man, or the man who used to be blind, he pushes back. And so they attack the man personally questioning his faith and his character, and they culminate this whole exchange with a dismissal. You were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they cast him out. And Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said, Are we also blind? Surely not, they think. We're not blind. We know the answers to all the questions including this one, even before we ask. No, we're not blind. Are you kidding us? Are we also blind? Do you and I have it all figured out? Who or what is right and who is wrong? Whose opinion is right, namely mine? And whose thoughts are all wrong. What should happen to us? Because we know it to be a good thing for us. And what should be avoided at all costs? We're certainly full of knowledge and confidence in the fact that we know it all. We know that we're right, and we're justified in our minds by rightness. And we're determined to succeed in the future endeavors because we're convinced that we are on the side of the angels, and God is our co-pilot, a second in command, making sure everything is lined up for us just the way that we want it to happen. We are blind. 
we can't see. We can't see this microscopic virus that changed our sense of reality in a way that has been never experienced by us, those who are alive right now, reminding that our sense of who is right and who is wrong and what to do next and what the future holds for us, none of that has been revealed to us. We're blind. We can't see. We don't know what's going to happen to us next. Not knowing leads to all kinds of temptations. When we don't know, we're anxious. We try to control things, and we realize that they are out of our control. And when things don't go the way that we want them to go, we get disappointed and angry and blame God. We do things according to what our plans are and according to our will, in effect telling God that his will for us is not good. Never mind the promise that he makes to us that he will make all things work for the good of those who love him. It's scary right now. We don't like this feeling of not knowing. We don't like this feeling of not being able to predict We don't have the knowledge. We don't have knowledge. And when you don't have the knowledge, you, re you need trusting. Trusting. That's having faith in things unseen. That's how the Scripture describes faith. Trusting is impossible. Faith isn't natural. It's impossible unless it is given to you by God. And having found the man, Jesus said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. You can say that with confidence. Lord, I believe. God doesn't give you and me the knowledge of the future. But God gives you faith. It was he who washed you clean of sin in the waters of your holy baptism. It is he, the word made flesh, who is present in his word when it is proclaimed. It is he who says to you, take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood for the forgiveness of sins. The same body and the same blood became flesh for you and went to the cross and rose again and ascended into heaven. You and I are blind to see the future. It is hidden from us. But through faith, you can see your Savior today. He is here in his word, in his means of grace, to forgive just as he promised, because God is faithful to you. You know this by faith and not by sight. And you go 
You go on to whatever lies ahead of you. You go in peace. Though not necessary to peace, don't expect the devil, the world, and your sinful nature to go easy on you just because you have heard the promises of God. And don't hold the Lord to the promises that he has not made, expecting an easy life in this world as his child, because his only begotten son himself suffered, even though he was innocent. You and I are guilty. You can expect your share of trouble. This unholy trinity, the devil, world, and sinful flesh, they will work their best and their hardest to convince you that the Savior's presence in your life at best doesn't do you any good. Or even worse, it leads to all kinds of trouble for you. They will produce all kinds of weapons of worry and guilt and anxiety and sickness and grief and even death. They will do their best to crush you. But the truth is, they have been crushed already. Crushed by the Son of God, whom you behold, whom you see today. They can make you miserable. They can make you sick. But their days are numbered. In Christ, your days are not numbered. You don't know what your future holds. We're reminded of it. We live one day at a time. You don't know the next chapter in your life, but in Christ, you know the end of the story. And the end of the story is life everlasting. Go in peace, for you are forgiven of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.